So the purpose of this YouTube thing is not necessarily to give our positions. Well, it probably will, but but just give you uh, a recap of what happened. Uh, basically, Airman's strongest points saying that Jesus uh, was a real historical person. Price's strongest points on why there is reason to doubt that he was. Um, but, but I don't really want to get into that uh, uh, until Cam gets here. Okay, so Cam's here. So let me do this. And let me add screen capture and put Cam in here. What configuration? Do you want to be si beside me or, or do you want to be below me? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I prefer. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah, as I said. Can you hear that jug in the background? Jug? Oh, uh, kettle. Oh, is is jug the New Zealand term for kettle? Yeah, it's like the electric kettle. Oh, okay. Oh, again, so uh, anybody listening to this via uh, uh, YouTube live stream, if you wouldn't mind tweeting this out to your friends, that'd be great. Uh, because we're going to talk about something that has never been done before. Uh, Robert T. Price. Uh, oh, M. Price. Oh, M? I thought it was T. Are you sure about that? Okay. Uh, 99.99. Are you certain? Do you know? Could you be wrong? <laughs> um, and uh, Bart Ehrman. So, the, uh, so Cam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Bart Ehrman's position is uh, that Jesus was a real person in history, but Bart Ehrman is an agnostic atheist just like Cam and I. So he does not believe the supernatural claims found in the Gospels or any else elsewhere. Uh, but he does believe that Jesus existed, and we'll talk about why that is in a bit. Uh, Robert Price's position, uh, we're getting a, a comment that your sound is low, Cam, so I don't know if you can talk closer to the mic. Uh, Robert Price's position is that there is a lot of reason to doubt whether the historical Jesus is in fact historical, that it could be completely myth and that um, that this Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist at all. So, Cam, what did you think was uh, Bart Ehrman's strongest argument tonight that we listened to to say that Jesus was, in fact, indeed a historical figure? Yeah, so I would agree. Uh, so Ehrman's strongest point was there's there's some things written by Paul uh, which predate the Gospels. And let me, let's be clear, Ehrman believes that half, uh, Paul wrote 13 books, Ehrman believes that seven of the 13 are authentic and six are um, forgeries. So, you know, before the Christians start cheering Ehrman, <laughs> remember he believes that uh, close to half of uh, Paul's letters are actual forgeries. Uh, but, so, but uh, Ehrman does say Oh, hang on. I am so sorry, guys. Uh, yeah. See, I whenever I mute myself, I mute you, Cam. So I gotta, I gotta stop that. So what? Okay, I'm not gonna mute myself anymore. Um, so what Cam basically said was that Aaron's strongest point was that Paul writes some uh, Galatians is before was written before the Gospels, and it mentions things like Jesus had a brother, that he was born. Uh, that he met people, real, uh, what Ehrman would say is real people. So uh, why would Paul write this before the Gospels were even written if Jesus didn't even exist? So that's that's Ehrman's main point. So he references Galatians 1.19, I believe, and and uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, say something now, Cam. Hello, my name is Cameron. <laughs> okay, I think I fixed it. Um, okay, is, is that better, guys? Hi, all. That's another problem. Just the debate tonight, the volume was very low as well. And so all of us were, 
oh, I mean, I was watching it by myself. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, I, I, I know what I did wrong, guys. My bad. Good thing we caught this early. Um, so we were straining to hear these guys while they were talking. Uh, we had the volume maxed out. But basically what Cam was saying is that, uh, that the uh, seven Pauline letters that are considered originals and not forgeries are all, they all predate the Gospels. And Ehrman's main point is, look, it is very clear that, uh, according to Paul, that Jesus had a brother, he was born, he died, all things that a real person would have, <laughs> okay? Um, now, Price's rebuttal to that is what, Cam? Um, well, I don't know if I should give Price's rebuttal, but... <laughs> okay, give, give uh, Price's rebuttal and then very briefly and give what you think a better rebuttal is. So Price argued um, that, at least in the case of the Galatians reference to uh, James, the brother of the Lord, that that on independent reasons, not because of a mythicist bias, um, scholars have argued that that is actually an interpolation into Paul's work. Um, I don't actually know those arguments, and so I essentially don't know whether or not that's a... So <laughs> I mean, Price, it's, so it's definitely a true claim that scholars have argued that. But, so Price is saying basically those passages where it says that Jesus uh, or James, brother of the Lord, are basically later scribes inserted that. That's Price's argument? Uh, maybe not even scribes, but um, possibly people in like the Paulinist tradition of Christianity. Okay. And then guys like... So the same types of people that forge letters in his name. And so guys like Carrier though, and yourself would say that uh, maybe they weren't interpolations that people just cross things out or just stuck things in, but rather when you read the original Greek, maybe things like born died brother have different different <clears throat> different meanings different interpretations in other words brother could mean a brother in the faith instead of a, a biological brother yeah so in the case of um in the case of the reference to james the brother brother of the lord um there and this is not just mythicists who have argued this in the past that it's um, appropriate to interpret that as saying James, a baptized Christian. So the word baptized isn't there, and neither is the, the word Christian, although that doesn't really appear in any New Testament text from my understanding. But it's essentially like a, a title, um, brother of the Lord, that is, that is given to baptized Christians. What? And... Carrier, or at least Carrier argues that, um, from my understanding, that when you look at the the way the Greek is written, it's more that he is said to be a brother of the Lord because Paul was trying to distinguish him from the Apostle Peter and make sure that it was clear that he wasn't saying that James was also an apostle. Right, got you. Because so prior to that, he says... Um, well, I mean, it would be worth bringing up the actual passage to, to read it to make sure that I don't get it wrong. But it's essentially like I met no one else other than Peter, the apostle, and James, the brother of the Lord. Right. So what guys like Carrier is saying is, uh, look, the brother here, uh, the, the uh, uh, Paul is basically saying, look, I don't want people to think James is an apostle. I want... So I'm going to use the word brother instead of, uh, uh, or to just basically to show that. And so, but it could be that it's not an actual brother, right? Yeah. So I think the context is that Paul was talking about when he visited Jerusalem and who he met, because um, if I remember the context correctly, he's um, 
saying about who essentially like who he conferred with it's like effectively like where did he get his tradition from right okay so i'm gonna post that actual thing in oh i can't well maybe i can no i can't um okay so and then the other one is first corinthians 15 i believe somewhere in there yeah so that's like the whole chapter there is um around like what type of body you will have um in the resurrection and it talks about it there's this section from i think it's verses three to eight where it's like this almost like this creedal type um framing where he says about like passing on the tradition and that just as jesus appeared to um apostles before him he also appeared to um to paul okay and now the whole thing about being born and and being uh killed how would a guy like uh price explain that um i don't actually remember in the debate price r rebutting that um but at least like i know what um other scholars have tried to argue is that the word the word that is used for born it's usually translated as born um oh hang on Are you t you're talking about the born of a woman passage right yeah yeah um i i think that the word born used there um can also be used to mean manufactured um and i think it's the same word that is used um to describe how our divine bodies or our spiritual bodies will be manufactured and um, the ones that we will resurrect in yeah, well, and um, one of the points that Ehrman and, and Price were talking about tonight is in the worldview back then, there was a, a third heaven, a second heaven, and so forth. I don't know which number heaven it was, but there was a reality that was outside the main heaven, but not on earth, where sort of like an intermediary type, and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong here, Cam, but there was sort of like a fuzzy area of existence that wasn't earth and wasn't, you know, where God resides. <clears throat> and this, yeah. and this is where, um, price thinks Paul is talking about this Jesus, that he was born in this reality. That's not the earthly one and was, uh, crucified and resurrected in that reality. Yeah, so like Carrier and um, Price, they argue that Paul's conception of Jesus as a being was that he was a pre-existent being and that he, um, something something like a, like a celestial being or a great angel, um, and that he essentially gives revelations to... Um, the followers of Paul, much like what um, revelations were received by Muhammad or um, or Joseph Smith or other founders of religions, and they they use the they t teach you about like essentially the context in, in which a lot of Greek and Hebrew people believed, where there were these different layers of heavens. And the, the idea, which a lot of it comes from this other text called the Ascension of Isaiah, is that Jesus like um, assumed a body and descended to the lower heavens, which is essentially the region between the earth and the moon, and was crucified by the um, archons or like the principalities and powers of, of the world, which is... An, assumed to be the devil um and his demons 
and it, he was crucified in the sublunar world and then resurrected there and ascended to heaven and yeah <laughs> I mean, yeah and this is not this is not like totally weird within that worldview because it's also mentioned oh no, yeah it's mentioned in genesis is it, is it not well i mean there's a like just like as an example i think um uh what's it called book of adam i think it's called like where um adam was believed to be buried in um in the sublunar or like essentially in one of the heavens um not on earth and in fact there was even a, a, like a a number of uh, Jewish strains of thought where um, paradise or the Garden of Eden, there was actually a copy of that in uh, the f in one of the heavens as well. So, like, people be at that time believed that there were all the these things going on in the worlds above us, in the realms above us, and that there were, like, actually copies of things um, as there are on Earth. So, for example... Um, some Jewish thought believed that there were there was like a divine temple um, in the heavens, like an actual physical temple, um, and yeah. It, it, so these beliefs aren't like um, uncommon for around the time. It's it seems really strange for people when they hear them today, but people don't really share the same cosmology today. They don't believe that there were like layers of heaven and like gates that you had to pass through and, and all of this kind of stuff. They think that space is just a vacuum. <laughs> yeah. And one, one quick point before I want to move on to what I think was uh, Price's strongest argument that says that there was no actual or there's reason to doubt at least that there was an actual Jesus is that Paul references the way he knows these things in Galatians and in, in other pre-gospel texts is through revelation and through the scriptures. But keep in mind when he says the word scriptures and these are written before the gospels, what scriptures is he referring to? He's referring to the old Testament scriptures, right? Yeah, well, and in, in fact, uh, it's quite plausible that he's referring to texts not within our canonized Old Testament as well. So you actually get examples like in Jude where you have books that are not in the Protestant canon, like the Book of Enoch, being um, quoted. So there were a lot of texts floating around. And not only that, there were also uh, Jewish practices like um, Midrash and, and Pesher, um, these different types of interpretations um, where like texts are prepared and interpretations are prepared using various sources of the Old Testament. Um, okay, so so it's not it's not even clear that like by scriptures he means um, exactly books that we have in the Old Testament because we know that there were lots of writings that Jews relied on that weren't in the Old Testament. Yeah, and that's you know that's a side. Uh, I want. I'll just throw in this side point, but Bible scriptures uh, are not equivalent. You know, using the word and God's word, these are all separate word uh, descriptions that people use. Like God's word might not equal Bible, may not equal Scripture, and you know, and all in between. So, um, okay. So prices, I think, strongest point. Oh, you want to before yeah before you go on to that because and I, I will leave i just wanted to make a brief comment about ehrman's what i would consider like a secondary form of argument although interestingly i actually think that he he tries to make this out as if it's his strongest argument and that is his appeal to the sources behind the gospels so he essentially admits as do the majority of um, secular scholars that the gospels generally aren't reliable for um, historic like historical um, facts about what occurred at the time um, it's admitted that they contain a, a, an enormous amount of um, like enlargement or like uh, what would you call it like embellishment um but it's also admitted um by most secular scholars that they also contain utter 
uh, fabrications as well, stories that were directly told for the purpose of telling a moral point or an ideological point or, um, you know, other types of messages, and these aren't things that happened on Earth. Now, Ehrman re- acknowledges that, but he uses these commonalities between the texts to infer, as do a consensus of scholars, that there are actually sources underlying these texts. Um, in particular, um, Q, which is the source that's inferred from the shared material in Matthew and Luke that isn't isn't present in Mark. Um, um, and also the source M, which is for the source material in Matthew that isn't shared with Luke or Mark. And then the source L, which is for the source material or the material in Luke that isn't shared in Matthew and Mark. Right. And, but, and essentially he thinks that these sources are reliable um, and that we can use them to glean details about Jesus's earthly life. And I think that that is a very poor epistemological method. And yeah, because many we don't know the authors of these agree. sources. <laughs> yeah, and we don't know whether or not they're reliable, and we don't know what their motivations were. We don't know what genre of text they fall within because we literally don't have these sources. They're only inferred. They're hypothetical sources, yeah. and they're essentially based upon a interpretive model um, where we're trying to figure out what accounts for the shared material between the other gospels. I but, don't yeah. do you think uh, do you think Price would say that there's actually only one source, even though there's four gospels? No, I, I think that he would say that um, there's no sources in the sense that Irma is talking. So he um, well, like no sources in the sense that they trace back to an earthly figure named Jesus who was the um, the cause of Christianity. Oh, one thing that I, uh, I'm reminded of, one of Ehrman's arguments was that um, besides Josephus, that Jesus, the person the historical figure is the second most attested figure in of that time period. So no, he, he made a more specific and this is a charitable fact <laughs> claim than that. He said no m- more attested um, Jew of that time and place, because I think he would admit that there is better attestation for like Roman. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that, you know, he talks about Josephus and he talks about Jesus, although I don't understand why, given his protestation in the last part of his talk about the reliability of Paul, I don't see, I mean, I really can't understand, like, why he doesn't think that Paul was better attested than Jesus, given the fact that we actually have words written by Paul, like... (laughs) I don't really Good get point. that. <laughs> Jesus never wrote a book. In fact, uh, he only the only thing he ever wrote was apparently his finger in the sand. So um, no, well, I mean that's actually an interpolation in the in the Gospel of John, um, yeah. <laughs> as as you know, like that doesn't appear in our earliest um, John uh, manuscripts. So would you agree then that uh, Airman's perspe- point would agree with uh, prices that people like. Tacitus, Josephus, uh, all, all the people in the first, second century, first, late se- first century, basically were, are not sources. Um, or not at ad- attestations. Sorry, what did you ask? Do you, did you ask if I agree with that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think that's what Airman uh, would say, that we can't use those guys because they're basically just retelling what they would have heard they're not eyewitnesses they didn't see any of this stuff it's hearsay yeah given the time period they wrote in um it's it would be a it would definitely be a probabilistic statement to say that they are independent sources 
because an equally probable or I think more probable explanation of where they got their material from is actually that they're repeating what Christians told them. Um, and, you know, many, many secular scholars have argued this. This is not a novel point. Um, and in fact, contrary to what Ehrman claims, most of the, um, the best scholarship on Josephus that I've read in, indicates that um, both the Testimonium Flavianum and the other reference to Jesus um, is uh, like they should be considered entire fabrications, not just um, like embellishments by a Christian author. And to let people know, this is uh, being recorded. So if, um, if you have to go, you can watch it later. Uh, one of, so Price said a lot of things. But I want to, he talked about one analogy, and I loved his analogy. He, and the analogy is this. Can you get Clark Kent if there's no Superman? Can Clark Kent exist if there's no Superman? And Price's main point is, really no, because Clark Kent is the sort of the alter ego of Superman. And so what price is getting at is okay airman if you're saying that you don't believe all these supernatural claims but you at the same time you're saying that jesus actually existed aren't you saying that clark kent existed even though there's no superman so if it makes sense in the analogy why isn't that making sense to you with this jesus character yeah and i think that is is an analogy it's um, like it, what would you say? Like it's really like really evocative. Like it's um, it's 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 appealing, but I actually think it's a bad analogy um, because it. I don't think it takes into account what Ehrman actually argues. And so, to give like what a better analogy would be of the picture that Ehrman paints. Um, you would have the stories of Superman, which included details in, of this person, Clark Kent. But um, instead of there being uh, fictional authors of, like, you know, authors of this fictional work, which produced both the Clark Kent and the Superman, there are also these other independent figures around Clark Kent that are, uh, you know, producing other material about him yeah. in independently of the authors of Superman. See, but the, here's where I struggle. If the question is, did Jesus exist? Like, to me, that is too general of a question because you could ask, to me, the better question is, is the Jesus of the Bible, is the Jesus of the Gospels, did that Jesus exist? Yeah, well, and we know the answer to that question, though, and it's one that secular scholars don't even debate. And the answer, well, I mean, they debate it for public forum, but that's because there are claims that need to be counted. But the, but the answer to that question is no. And this is, like, absolutely clearly demonstrated by the fact that for the last 200 years, scholars have been publishing works about this historical Jesus, which almost bears no, res no resemblance to the Christ of faith, the biblical Jesus. And I think it's clear in the eyes of secular scholars that the biblical Jesus doesn't exist. Yeah, and plus the biblical Jesus implies a personal savior, a personal Jesus. So when you have this concept of a Jesus that exists in you and almost exists on how you see him in you or how your brain interprets whatever that Jesus in you does to you. Does it become a historical, is it a, at the same time a historical figure if it can be so many different things to so many different people? Because it's a personal Jesus. And so this is where I struggle when, when like when people ask me. But that's the, I th once again I think where that misses is that like it it's not taking into account what what like it would be a great analogy if 
it weren't for the fact that Christians believe that Jesus still exists. It would be a great analogy if if people still believe that Jesus exists. No, if if it weren't the case that all the Christians out there that claim to have a personal relationship with Jesus believe that he still exists, they're not having a personal relationship with this Christ that they've manifested in. Well, I mean, that's what I think they're doing. But like from their perspective, they're like relating directly with this being that still exists, kind of in the same way that Paul received revelations from a celestial being. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess my main point here was to say, like, when people ask me personally, like, and like uh, Travis did earlier, do I believe that Jesus ever existed historically? Uh, the first po thing that pops in my head is which Jesus? Like, yes, exactly. Which <laughs> like, Jesus? Which Jesus? Are, are you talking with the Jesus as described exactly in the Gospels? Then my answer is a clear no. But if you're, yeah. but if you're talking about some fuzzy Jesus that exists as maybe the basis or um, f like, a, like a screenplay, like that a story was loosely based on, then maybe, sure. Um, and if you're talking about uh, the Jesus that lives in the heart that people believe that lives within them, well, yes, that, and again, I believe that's in the imagination, but that thought does exist, that it, imagination does exist, that Jesus within the imagination exists. So it's a real tough question to answer without, you know, qualifying it. Yeah, I see what you mean. And that's like, that's part of the reason why somebody like Raphael Latesta, um, a recent, um, he doesn't actually have his PhD yet, but he um, will do very soon. Um, he argues that the discussion that's occurring, like between Price and Ehrman, or like the discussion that's occurring between himself and other secular scholars is a discussion that pretty much like leaves Christians at the door. And it's not that they're not like necessarily welcome. It's just that they're arguing about a different Jesus. Like they're arguing that not like they have so much evidential burden to climb that they can't even establish I mean, that Jesus existed, let alone that he performed all of these miracles as attributed to him in the Gospels. And it's really a discussion among secular scholars. Um, yeah. But, uh, and there are so many different historical Jesuses as well. Mm -hmm. There's the, the um, magician Jesus. There's the um, social reformer Jesus. There's the... Um, insurrectionist jesus there's the apocalyptic prophet there's the um yeah i mean there's many different models for jesus well if you're a theonomist or a strict trinitarian or whatever there's the old testament jesus that's right but yeah in the discussion of historical jesuses that have been hypothesized there are many different models that scholars try to make um, explain the evidence that we have in the New Testament. And I don't think that really any of them does what, they don't really do the text justice because they're talking about something for which we have really no evidence for. Like, they're talking about this Jesus that, like, we are only inferring on the basis of the Gospels when the Gospels don't describe this Jesus. They don't describe this Jesus at all. No, the Gospels, they describe a full-fledged miracle walking, uh, walking on water, miracle working, water into wine, um, stilling the storm, yep. controller of the fig trees and... See, and and, teleporter and, to space jesus and and so okay so if you're a christian watching this now or on the replay what cam is basically alluding to is i think if you're viewing airman as a christian and price who doesn't believe that that uh, jesus even existed i would think as a christian you should respect price's position more because he is being more consistent because airman is I think from the Christian worldview is being this wishy-washy guy who's saying, oh, he, Jesus existed. But in every instance that Jesus is described in the Bible, it's the miracle worker, Jesus, that Ehrman denies. 
Exactly. It's like, oh, and to, to give a, another analogy, it's like how these nominal Christians claim that, oh, well, you know, Jesus wasn't really divine, but he was like a moral guy and he was a great teacher and he was a great moral teacher. Like, well, I'm sorry, you're just doing like murder to the Gospels because that's not what they're about. It's, you've just misunderstood the Christian literature and you're not explaining it. It's So I, I think, were you shocked to hear that Price didn't even believe that Paul wrote Galatians? No, because I've like heard, okay. um, I've listened to him a lot on the Bible Geek and he wrote a book called, I mean, and this is years in the making, um, The Amazing Colossal Apostle. He, he, um, I don't really understand that view because to be honest, I haven't dug into it enough, but he, um, yeah, he thinks that Paul's letters are better explained by, um, like some, something to do with Marcionism and something to do with, um, the, uh, what's his name? The guy who's referenced in the magic worker and who is referenced in the book of acts um can't remember i i haven't really paid much attention to attention to it so yeah so basically what price is saying look you can look at the gospels especially and see where that came from and you and you could start from you could you could basically imagine a case where this historic this Jesus did not exist historically and still get there get the gospels based on the old testament and based on some other greek texts um, well you can get the gospels um based off of something said in paul as well yes yeah exactly and and the same arguments made for paul's writings that paul um not the stories of course but carry on yeah that that a lot of what paul wrote could have come from other texts as sort of like um, principles or, or ways of conveying um, different, I don't know, moral stories or whatever you want to say. So I think that's where, where Price is coming from, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that Price would acknowledge that like Paul's letters mostly concern matters um, of earthly churches. Yeah, that's true. Um, but there, are, but there is, um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm definitely um, convinced. You know, not with a hundred percent certainty, and I could change my mind. But I think that there are many examples in um, the Gospel of Mark where you can clearly see the direct parallels with what is being written and with other fictional stories in the Old Testament. Um, so much so that like Jesus is being portrayed as like a better Moses and like a better Elijah and a even um, a, a, a character that embodies better values than um, the Homeric, uh, like Homer's works. Okay, in the Q and A section. So basically, the way the debate worked tonight is. Uh, Price spoke for 10 minutes, Airman spoke for 10 minutes, Price spoke for 10 minutes, Airman spoke for 10 minutes. Then they, seven minutes each, rebutted each other twice. Then there was a QA. and a uh, And a couple times, I, I think Price didn't even use all of his time. Um, I don't know if Price was a little sick tonight. He was blowing his nose a couple times. He refused to hang onto the mic because I guess he was scared of maybe he had to blow his nose and didn't want to have, have that sound go through. But... I don't think Price really looked that comfortable. Um, I, I would have loved to have Carrier there instead of Price, but anyhow. Um, in the Q&A, though, one person asked a, a great question of Airman, and the question is, what would change your mind about the question of historical versus mythical? And Airman answered saying, Basically, if there was more scholars who agreed with Price. <laughs> that was basically his answer, right? Well, no, I think that the question wasn't actually, like, so to give credit to Ehrman, I don't think that the question was what would change your mind. I think that what would make you take this issue more seriously. Right, okay, yeah. 
Um, and, and he basically said, I don't think Ehrman thinks that Price is any less of a scholar than him. I hope not, at least. But basically, Ehrman said that if if there was well-published uh, um, people who shared Price's opinion, um, respected people, scholars, historians, who shared um, Price's opinion. And I thought that answer was interesting because how would you, let's say you were wrong about something in a certain field of science and you wouldn't really start leaning towards it, po the possibility of being wrong about your position until you see more other people <laughs> do it. Uh, I think that that's the wrong way of going about it. Mm. I mean, it is true that we that we only have like a finite time to to do research and to read other like so there is a lot there is a lot published in the field of biblical studies and or New Testament scholarship in particular and so there is some like merit to being exclusive and what you spend your time on or being mindful of what you spend your time on. But I don't know. I, the thing that I would argue is that Ehrman should have at least read Carrier and Latesta's work, um, or in particular Carrier's. I mean, he wrote a book about method before publishing a book on the question where he argues probabilistically and not like dogmatically towards a conclusion that Jesus may not have existed. Like he, most scholars who write on the historical Jesus don't even establish what method they're using before they write on it. They just put pen to paper and just like assume that their methods are valid. And I, I think that his work should be at least taken seriously by somebody like Ehrman before he, you know, demands that more scholars um, publish before he takes it seriously. I was... I uh, I he was, is a serious scholar. I was... Um, I forget where this was. It was somewhere in Wisconsin? It was in Madison? And um, I was actually surprised to see that most of the questions went to Ehrman and not Price. It was um, Milwaukee. Milwaukee, okay. Um... Yeah, I think that because of the because the conference or um, debate was organized by a mythicist organization. Oh, it was okay. I missed that part. I didn't. I didn't realize it was yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I th I think that that's why. Um, but I didn't think that they really asked him hard questions like. I, I would have asked him something along the lines of, like, how can you rely on sources that are non-existent and only hypothetical when we have no means to verify their contents or establish their trustworthiness or establish even their genre? Um, how can we rely on those as being historical documents when... Um, when they could just as easily be as fictional as what the Gospels are. So, Price is an atheist. Ehrman's an atheist. Question is, uh, I can imagine some people asking this question, what does it matter then to, the, to these guys, uh, not, not professionally, but just personally, whether this Jesus existed or not? Yeah, I mean, I think it shouldn't matter to them other than their own scholarly interest in history. Because you can explain, like, how the Roman Empire expanded and so forth and embraced Christianity, whether this Jesus existed or not. You can, you can have an easy explanation both ways. Um, so you know, in, it, it's any of the historical Jesus pro Jesus's proposed by secular scholars have no relevance to whether or not um, 
like God exists or Christianity is true. Well, I guess they do have relevance to whether or not Christianity is true. But what I'm trying to say is that like none of them. um, Yeah, you get what I'm saying. I think the one area where it is relevant, and this is sort of getting off the debate, but getting maybe to the purpose of the debate is how atheists interact with theists or Christians in particular. Because if you are an atheist and you're talking about God and Jesus to a Christian and you come out and say, well, I don't even believe Jesus actually existed. What are the chances you're going to have a productive conversation after that point? (laughs) Like they're going to basically write you off. The Christian will write the atheist off and say, this guy is just a nut job. Uh, Of course he existed. All the scholars agree, which is not true. Uh, but most of them agree. Um, so I do see value in either or not, if, if you truly believe that Jesus did not exist historically, um, I, I would probably fr- answer the question like, I think there's reason to doubt that Jesus existed historically. So if I was to give advice to an atheist on how to respond to that in that situation without destroying the conversation, without, you know, basically, if you want the conversation to move forward, instead of saying, no, I don't believe that Jesus existed, um, put it, frame it as, and it's still true, you're not lying, you're just saying, I highly doubt that the historical Jesus existed, but could have. If you're a agnostic atheist, of course, you're being honest, you could say, but he could have existed, historically. So, I've got to hop off now, but, um, I would just to um, help people understand my position, my personal position a little bit more on this question. Um, I would say that I'm like agnostic, like that I just don't, for me, it doesn't seem like the evidence gives us enough information one way or the other to determine whether or not there was a historical person behind the origins of Christianity. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for coming on, Cam. It's nice to talk to you, dude. Yep. See ya. Bye. Uh, If anybody has questions in the chat, I can answer some before I leave. But my position uh, as well, I stated it earlier, but um, I view the Gospels as a screenplay. And so I personally think and believe that uh, whoever wrote the Gospels, I, I don't believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote them, but they could have. There could be guys out there a long time ago who had those names and wrote those. But I believe that basically, you, if you knew the Old Testament very well, if you knew Greek literature really well, you and if you and if there was indeed a person, a Jesus of Nazareth who existed, who was charismatic, who was apocalyptic, you could have written the Gospels uh, without the majority of it being true. You you know, when I say loosely based on a historical figure, that part would be true. But um, there's just so many things that the Gospels especially borrow from. Like there's some word for word lines in the Gospels straight out of the Old Testament. And um, there's a lot of places where it says this was done to fulfill the prophecy of and then it quotes the old testament now christians view that as oh wow look how amazing this is whereas the skeptic or agnostic or atheist would say well isn't that a red flag to you guys that maybe this was written just to say that (laughs) it was fulfilled um so yeah i there was many passion plays of the day a passion play is basically you have to suffer before you can receive glory there was many passion plays of, the, of that time. Jesus is a passion. Jesus suffered in order to receive glory, in order for everyone to see, receive glory. So it's, just, it's another passion play that was historicized later. And so that's my personal opinion. And I could be wrong. And um, everything in the Gospels could be right, and I could be going to hell. 
although I could be one of God's elect and going to heaven too. So This was actually a big deal because people have been begging to hear Price and Ehrman uh, debate each other, and it's never happened before. And so it just happened a couple hours ago. It was a pay-per-view pay event, and um, and so I thought I would pay the 10 bucks and watch it, and I invited um, Cam to watch it with me. And so I thought I would just give a recap of what happened. Um, I actually think Ehrman, as far as the debate goes, yeah, well, yeah, Matt Dillahunty was moderating. Uh, Matt basically didn't say anything um, the whole night. I don't know why they asked him to moderate it. Uh, maybe just to get more viewers. Um, to me, Ehrman is a better debater. Uh, I don't think it's even close, in my opinion. Um, like when Price, Price likes to do accents and imitations once in a while when he reads the perspective of other scholars, so he'll change his voice. I think it, it's cute at first, but gets tiresome after a while. And um, so I think Ehrman, Ehrman was more articulate, more fluid, more smooth. I think uh, Price was a little more choppier. He, and uh, Price, in my opinion, is more esoteric in his language. He uses, I think, more words that and references more people that the average person has no idea what he's talking about. Whereas I think uh, Ehrman is better at having the common lay person understand. So, yeah. So for that reason, I think uh, Bart Ehrman won the debate. So, okay. Take care, everyone. Have a great great weekend and we'll see you next time.